Hello, and welcome to Liquid Margins episode 41, driving engagement and building community insights from partners on the hypothesis impact. Uh, we're going to let folks sort of file in here and then get started with our conversation in just a second. So I'll probably give it 30, 40, maybe 60 seconds uh, before we actually get started here. But you're in the right place if you're here for Liquid Margins, uh, hosted by Hypothesis. Um, and we're here to talk with some of our partners about how they roll out Hypothesis on their campuses. So hang tight for just a couple seconds and then we'll officially get started here. All right, it looks like the students have, have filed in here. We've got a great audience today. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, welcome to Liquid Margins episode 41, driving engagement and building community, insights from partners on the hypothesis impact. So I'm really excited about this episode. Actually, I'm gonna hold off on getting to tell, tell you about my excitement. I'm gonna do the housekeeping first. I always forget about the housekeeping. I don't wanna dive right into the ideas. Uh, so in terms of the housekeeping stuff, let's see here. Um, we have an upcoming episode on STEM, which I'm very excited about. Mark your calendars for June 28th. We've got a great group of scientists and mathematicians and computer scientists that will be joining us on the 28th from a variety of schools. Um, so mark that on your calendar. And then sometime in July, we're gonna be doing social annotation as instructional scaffolding. I'm excited about this episode too, because we're gonna be rolling out some features that are gonna better enable uh, instructors to move annotations between groups, to move annotations between courses. Uh, not every teacher annotates for students or with students, um, but I think we're gonna to start to see more of that as we roll out features that make it easier for instructors to do that. So we're gonna be talking to some instructors who do scaffold assignments, who pre-populate text with annotations, prompts, or model annotations. So I'm excited about that one. Stay tuned to all the channels about, um, about that one coming soon. Um, so today, Look at Margins is really a conversation around pedagogy and strategies for implementing annotation uh, and implementing hypothesis. If you're here for kind of an introduction to the tool, you should stick around because I think you'll be inspired, um, but this is not gonna be a real how-to. If you want a how-to, you should reach out to education at Hypothesis, and we also have a lot of YouTube uh, videos and uh, to, to check out if you kind of want some of the basics, but we're happy to also provide a live demo. But today we're gonna dive deep pretty quick in terms of how social annotation is used um, on our campuses and in the classroom. And then finally, if you have a question, you can uh, use the Q&A feature. We don't have the chat turned on today. Um, so drop questions in the chat and we have a team, my team of CSMs are here, customer success managers are here to answer those questions. Um, and so feel free to jump in there. And then finally, if you'd like closed captioning, there's a way to turn that on uh, within your own Zoom window. All right, so I think that is the, oops, back one. Um, Great, so driving engagement and building community insights from our partners on the hypothesis impact. I'm gonna be very brief with my introduction, but I just wanna say, I'm super excited about this episode. We're doing something a little different today. Uh, on Liquid Margins, we're typically speaking with classroom instructors about their use of social annotation uh, and teaching. Um, but today we're taking a step back and talking to a group of folks who support instructors using hypothesis and other technologies and practices in their teaching. That's not to say that some of you guys may also still be in the classroom. I know there's many hats that get worn um, uh, in your roles, but uh, at Hypothesis, you're largely known as our kind of primary points of contact for the broader implementation of social annotation on your campuses. And that's why you're here today. Uh, I'm gonna say it up, uh, up front here. I hate the word vendor. Uh, I'm an educator by calling and training uh, and much of the staff at Hypothesis, including my co-host Christy DeCarolis and many of our CSMs who are manning the, or humaning the Q&A, um, we're educators uh, by, by, by calling and by training. Uh, that's our background, some as, as classroom teachers, some as instructional designers. Um, and we really still view ourselves as educators supporting the learning of students. And so as such, we really view our relationships with customers, our collaborators as partnerships. Uh, we listen to our partners about their unique goals and challenges, and we try to help them leverage social annotation to address those challenges and goals. Uh, we're always learning from our partners about new and interesting ways to use hypothesis, uh, new and interesting ways to introduce hypothesis to a campus. Um, and our partner feedback really guides everything we do from feature development to what workshops and other programming we offer, liquid margins, episode ideas, all, all of this stuff is really driven by the needs of our teachers and our you know, instructional support partners like those that are joining us today. So that is all to say, let's introduce the group. Um, 
We have four schools represented and two schools have sent two reps because they were eager to, to bring the whole team, uh, which is awesome. Um, so these are our panelists. We've got Megan Grady, Associate Director of Academic Partnerships at Butler University, joined by her colleague, Kristen Palmer, team lead in, instruct uh, in instructional technology also at Butler. So welcome friends from Butler University. And then from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, we have education technology specialist, Dana Kennard, who's uh, probably of this group, I'd say, been around the longest. I mean that in the nicest of ways. Uh, well, the, Santa Cruz is a long time partner and we've been working with Dana for a long time. And as I've gone to uh, conferences in California, a lot of people will say that she's the one that introduced them to hypothesis, sometimes even when they weren't there and no longer at Santa Cruz. So thanks and welcome Dana. And then from Portland Community College, we have two folks joining us, James Pepe, welcome, and David Vasquez. Uh, both are instructional technology specialists at Portland Community College. Uh, so welcome from the great state of Oregon. And then uh, finally, last but not least, Vince St. Germain, Senior Instructional Design Specialist at Grand Valley State University. So this is the group, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. And let's get started. So we're gonna to try to make this as much of a conversation as possible. Again, if you're in the audience and you want to, uh, to, to ask a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll sort of include you in that conversation. Um, but the first uh, you know, area that I wanted to, to talk to you guys about is just what led your campus to adopt hypothesis social annotation? Uh, and maybe since you've been around the longest, again, I mean that in the nicest of ways, Dana, uh, you might start our conversation on, on this topic. What led you guys to adopt social annotation at Santa Cruz? Thanks, Jeremy. Well, it was the enthusiastic and excellent instructors in our writing program who were leading the push for adoption. Uh, they immediately saw the benefit of social annotation and were very persistent about getting it. Um, we piloted in fall 2020. So as you said, it's been a few years mm -hmm. for us. Um, this was during the uh, period of emergency remote instruction. And I think immediately students and instructors are like, uh, like we're very excited to have a solution for discussion that wasn't simply over Zoom. Um, of course, we've moved beyond that now um, and Hypothesis continues to blossom uh, across mm -hmm. all subjects on our campus, it includes chemistry, history, sociology, biology, um, and more. That's great, Dana. Yeah, uh, it really, Santa Cruz is a great, use case for seeing a particular discipline adopt, but then it, it grow from there, which has been really cool to see over the years. And now I think Santa Cruz is one of our, our biggest campuses in terms of usage. Um, let's go to Vince next. Vince, what led uh, Grand Valley State to, to look at social annotation as a teaching tool? So first I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me today as a panelist uh, during today's session. And we've been a partner for approximately two years now. So going back to August of 2021, we actually had a faculty who had been using Hypothesis, using the web-based version of it, who was trying to integrate it directly into what was her Blackboard Learn original course. And she was experiencing some problems with the setup and with that installation. So she had reached out to our department. And in turn, then we contacted what was Hypothesis Technical Support. Now, they were just absolutely fabulous. They provided us with all of the information that we needed. We were able to get her set up, and she was immediately able to start using that during what was that upcoming fall semester. But during those conversations, we also learned that there were other faculty at our university who had been using Hypothesis as well. So we engaged in a discussion then with our customer success manager to try and determine what different options were available to us for implementing what was hypothesis on a more seamless and easy to set up basis. And that's when we then started to talk about the LTI integration into our Blackboard LMS. And we, at that point, discussed the opportunities to set up a pilot and begin that process for what would be our winter semester for 2022. I'm sorry, Jeremy, are you, were you speaking? 
Yes, I forgot to unmute myself. Thanks, Vince. Uh, do you have any memories of, of what led that initial instructor, what discipline they were in and why they were excited about social annotation initially? And it sounds like they were using hypothesis in the wild outside the LMS and then you helped them and others get it integrated. But do you remember what they were excited yeah, about? She was in our writing department and okay. they have been huge advocates for the use of hypothesis during uh, the past two years. Uh, we have a number of faculty who were part of that early pilot that we had initially set up then for what was that winter 2022 semester. One of the things we did was we took a look at, or after getting what was basically a list of contacts that you had at Hypothesis, we reached out to those faculty and just inquired as to whether or not they would be available and interested in participating as part of that a pilot. And they were uh, more than happy to hear that the university was taking steps to now fully integrate the tool directly into our courses. Excellent. Yeah, uh, that's so cool that folks were using the sort of free what we call you know hypothesis in the wild, and then you were able to help them kind of integrate with the LMS, which is far easier when you're starting to scale out the the usage of social annotation. Awesome. Well, friends from Butler, uh, Megan, what led uh, Butler to uh, explore social annotation for teaching and learning? So um, prior to my current role, I was an academic technology specialist, and we had, a, you know, a handful of faculty who would come to our office and say, I'm getting really concerned about my students not doing the reading. Um, what can I do to encourage deeper engagement and excitement about reading? What might that look like? And so we started having some conversations around annotation tools and collaborative annotation, which then led us to do a pilot with a small group of faculty who had expressed interest over the years of, of for these kinds of collaborative annotation tools and had used the tool, as you said, Jeremy, in the wild um, and had found that it was very helpful in that regard. I think also one aspect of education that faculty really want to push forward with students is this idea about scholarship as conversation and getting students to think about scholarship in that way in the papers they write, but also in the annotation you know, world that gives you the opportunity for entry points into scholarship in a different way and to have conversations with your peers. So mm -hmm. really driving that home. And since we did the pilot and we did some, um, you know, assessment to see how students liked it, we got some really good feedback and then moved forward with, with the contract with Hypothesis. So we moved out of the pilot stage, I want to say near the end of 2020. I mean, yes. Was it? Okay. I'm trying to think, remember, Kristen, if that was the, the correct one. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, before we go to PCC, I just want to pull the room here real quick. I really, uh, you know, interested in what you said, Megan, about this concern that faculty came to you with about students not doing the reading. Does that resonate with others here that, like, you have faculty that are anxious about this? <laughs> uh, have you heard that before? You guys are so obedient. You're you're not uh, you're you're just nodding your heads. Let's go to PCC and hear what they have to say about uh, what led um, Portland Community College to adopt hypothesis. And again, don't be shy to. It's okay if you cough or you know laugh uh, at, at jokes. You know, don't feel like you have to always be on mute. Uh, again, we can make this a conversation. But but Portland Community College. I think James, were you going to uh, kick it off for Portland Community College with these earlier questions? Yes, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be here with us today. I do hope that what we're sharing is a useful and fruitful learning experience. Your time is important and precious, and I do hope that we'll get something out of this. So um, I was actually an instructor. I come from a writing and literature background before I was brought into my role as an instructional technology specialist. So I think I can speak to hypothesis from the instructor's point of view. I think you'll experience teaching um, online, remote good old fashioned brick and mortar face-to-face -face in multiple settings. And as soon as I saw Hypothesis, because it was chosen by my excellent team before I was brought on, I said, wow, this is fantastic. This is great, okay? Because, well, it reminded me very much of what the noted um, technical writing author, Paul B. Anderson says in his book, A Technical Communication, A Leader-Centered Approach. He cites audience awareness as the fundamental difference between ineffective writer-based communication and effective reader-based communication. So what does that mean? Reader-based communication is a dialogue. It's a dialogue between you and your potential reader. 
our readers are not brains and fat. So what we're trying to do is anticipate their emotional and intellectual responses line by line, moment by moment to what we are writing. So by anticipating the reader's needs, we can communicate complex information to fellow experts and non-experts alike. And what hypothesis we do it, it was doing that from a reader's perspective. You are engaging in a dialogue with the text and to draw some language from our excellent Portland area hypothesis plan just before it anchors the text in the discussion in a way that the traditional discussion form in the LMS just cannot do and do well. And since so many of our instructors are comfortable with Google Docs, okay, all right, and that kind of annotation, this parallels that and it syncs so nicely to the LMS, either as an extra credit assignment, no stakes assignment, or as a great assignment directly into the grade book. It works wonderfully, very smooth. And our instructors like it because it's something you can pick up midstream in a course, okay, and say, yep. you know what, I feel like replacing. I don't know, the fifth week discussion board with hypothesis, and they can do it and do it quickly, very quickly. It syncs up nicely, and they, and they just get excited about it, enthusiastic about it. It makes me excited, too. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, that's great, James. Yeah, we like. I sometimes talk about hypothesis as sort of Google Docs for every anything, right? Anything, any text on the internet. Um, there's a couple of themes that I just want to pull out and see if anybody wants to riff, riff off of. Uh, James echoed something that Megan said about dialogue, right? Uh, the importance of helping students understand that they're entering when they come to college, when they start to work as, you know, scholars in an academic setting, um, they're part of a conversation and to encourage them to participate in that conversation is so powerful. So I want to know if, any, if anybody wants to sort of riff off of that idea of either um, the importance of kind of th uh, helping students think around uh, themselves as scholars or being part of an ongoing dialogue. And then also uh, the, yeah, any, anybody want to riff off of that, the more sort of pedagogical reasons that folks uh, approach hypothesis? Go ahead, Vince. Well, we've got a faculty person who has become a real advocate and actually one of our hypothesis champions here at the university. She assists in all of our training sessions, providing her experience uh, as well as her students and what that's meant in terms of students' ability to engage then in the course content. She starts, or at the very beginning of her course, she uses hypothesis for the purposes of having her students delve very deeply into what is her course syllabus. And she gives them an opportunity then to be able to review that syllabus, to be able to indicate then directly within the margins, the kinds of things that they don't understand or that they might be concerned with, things that they are very excited about experiencing during what will be that course, um, as well as uh, talking uh, just overall about uh, what other things could actually be brought to the course in terms of suggestions that they might have for improving the kinds of interactions that are going to be taking place. And one of the things or feedback that she got from her students was that in all the time that she had been a graduate student at our university and had engaged in hours and hours of discussion boards and forums where all they were doing was exchanging text, she really felt that by using hypothesis and being able to review that syllabus, that she was finally able to engage with her faculty as well as the other students so that they could all begin in this uh, place where everyone had an understanding of what the course requirements were going to be and that the faculty was also deeply engaged in that work and going to ensure that students were going to be successful. Yeah, and that the faculty was sort of opening up the course itself as dialogue, right? The syllabus is, a, is a, the beginning of the conversation. Dana, I'm just basing this on unmuting. Uh, do you want to add anything? <laughs> yes, yes, that was my good uh, note. Thank you. Um, scholarship, uh, Megan said scholarship is a conversation, and that really has resonated with me and my experience with the instructors at my campus. Uh, one of the comments that really sticks with me every time I think about hypothesis, and I'm telling other instructors about it, is one of our instructors, champions, I like that word, Vince, I think I'm going to start using it, 
um, they use it very deeply in their course. And their comment was that um, seeing the quality of the annotations transform from the beginning of the quarter to the end of the quarter um, was really incredible. Students start asking more in-depth questions and being more analytical um, as they engage with the text. And that's a skill that's gonna stay with them beyond the course. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Yeah. Just just to piggyback on that, this conversation is kind of bringing a mind, into mind a very popular quote. This is not going to be news to anyone, but the Benjamin Franklin quote that talks about, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And I think one thing that hypothesis does is it involves students at a level that typical kind of academic technology tools can't, and particularly like responding to readings and doing different things like that. To add to the involve me and I learn, there's also kind of this idea involve me and I belong. I feel like mm -hmm. I have a community around me and I feel like I have a place in this community. And I find that um, talking about someone had just mentioned doing it with the syllabus. I think one of the things that gets students more comfortable with using hypothesis is to start out with low stakes yeah. type assignments because it can be very in intimidating when you start saying scholarship is conversation and you're scholars and you're part of this. <laughs> students are like, I'm not quite ready to have that be part of that conversation, Step up right? To the like, <laughs> like, don't let me do, I'm not ready for that, but maybe give me some low stakes that I can do up front and start getting responses from my peers and start communicating yeah. with my peers in that way. And then when we move on to annotating like an important historical document, I've had the opportunity to see that inserting my voice in, in these documents doesn't have dire consequences. And then I'm not yeah. doing something really scary. That's great. Yeah. I want to hear your voice is a pretty simple thing to say uh, and to offer a platform for. All right. So we're very, this is all very nice to hear how wonderful hypothesis is, but of course, it's not easy <laughs> to um, introduce a new technology on a campus uh, to shift from the discussion forum. Discussion forum has been around since even I was in the classroom, since so the early 2000s, <laughs> uh, right? It's a tried and true tool. And there's some people who probably you've had a hard time getting even to use the LMS, I'd imagine, right? Um, and so I appreciate how much, how excited you guys are uh, about Hypothesis and how excited your faculty are and how far it's come in the time that you've worked with them. But um, talk a little bit about some of the strategies or obstacles that you might have encountered as you uh, tried to roll this out on campus. Um, and maybe we'll start this time with uh, Portland Community College. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Jeremy. So one of the possible obstacles that we've had just had to do with sort of understanding and meeting our faculty where they are. At our particular college, 76% of the instructors there, of which I was once a part of, are considered part-time. And yet, there's nothing part-time about what they do because they're usually working for multiple institutions and sometimes dealing with three different LMSs in the same day, no exaggeration. So how to actually encourage them to try a new tool, okay? Because they're all subject matter experts, they're all very good at what they do, but they're balancing so many different things, okay? And so I understand anyone's trepidation. So what we did is we found certain instructors who are champions of hypothesis and using it effectively in the classroom. And what we did is we created what we call, we call faculty show and tells. In other words, um, Jessica Fuller, once again, our excellent Portland area hypothesis trainer, worked with us to co-facilitate these trainings. So we had faculty members giving demonstrations on what they're doing with hypothesis, how students are more engaged, taking surveys, sharing what kind of objective feedback they're getting on the subject matter. And cause and effect, we have now instructors immediately after their training who have been contacting me, contacting David, contacting my other IPS colleagues, like, how do I get this started? How do I, I'm, I'm interested. That's not so hard. What can I do? So, um, plus, we were able to offer some stipends as well that actually account for professional development. So that was an encouragement. Thank you. Did the, how did that stipend piece work, James? That's provided by the, the system? Um, yes, our, our department had put together a fund of money, you know, to encourage professional development um, for, uh, for, for in-house training um, facilitated by us. And that um, has actually encouraged, really encouraged enrollment, um, and rightfully so. 
I just want to amplify your celebration of Jessica Fuller, uh, the CSM for the Northwest. Uh, and also, uh, I do appreciate she's from the Portland area, but she's given me a hard time for not being able to pronounce the town that she actually lives in. I think it's Scapoose. I uh, just want that on the record here because I've been teased before for not saying it correctly. Um, Vince, talk a little bit about rollout at uh, Grand Valley State. So we actually wanted to start small just because our e-learning team was not very familiar with social annotation or really what the capabilities were for the tools. So we had that existing list of faculty that we knew were using it in the uh, wild, so to speak. And we had reached out to them and they all committed then to helping to facilitate what was the pilot during our winter semester. And so they used it in their courses. We got feedback from them as well as their students and found that it was really going to be a great fit in terms of the work that they wanted to try and accomplish and the engagement that they were asking for from their, their students. And as an e-learning team, we also discovered that it was going to be fully supportable, that there wasn't any uh, specialized training that uh, was going to be necessarily required in order to be able to ensure that faculty could use the tool. So at that point, we then opted to purchase what was our license, and we prepared them to roll it out in the fall of 2022 to the entire university. And as a lead up to that, what we were doing was trying to get out as much information about Hypothesis and promote it to our university, uh, basically across all of our campuses. So we have a monthly e-learning newsletter that goes out to all faculty, all administrators on our campus. We highlighted the fact that we were going to be introducing the tool. And along with that, we were going to be uh, providing then faculty with a number of training seminars that were facilitated initially by Becky George. And that work has continued uh, with Suzanne Miller. They just do an outstanding job of uh, informing our faculty and training them on the use of the tool in what is now our Blackboard Learn Ultra Learning Management System. Uh, we also sent a variety of emails out to targeted faculty and departments who we knew were going to be, uh, you know, maybe uh, more interested in using the tool or no, now knowing that we have it available and that it's an integrated part of what is our Blackboard Learning Management System that they could immediately begin to certainly take advantage of that. And we built a Blackboard course site where all faculty who are enrolled in what is uh, those training sessions get automatically enrolled, which gives them access then to a variety of hypothesis resources. The one thing that we have found that has been very important to uh, the increase in the amount of usage across campus is just simply word of mouth. And we've gone ahead and proactively asked faculty who use the tool, who like it, to encourage their colleagues to start using it as well. And overall, we've seen just a huge increase over what has been that first year and a half of usage to the point where now that we're getting ready to sign what is our second license agreement, we've actually doubled the number of seats wow. that we expect to uh, actually be using then for this upcoming academic year. That's great. Uh, so many wonderful uh, tips here for folks. Maybe you guys are learning from each other as well, but I'm hoping there's some folks in the audience who uh, may be in similar positions and thinking about how to roll this out um, and getting some really great pro tips here. Uh, Butler, how's it worked on your campus to, to roll this out? Yeah, um, I saw there was a question in the chat about a competitor tool, and we did look at other tools in our process um, and didn't just go with hypothesis because we had faculty using that, um, although we had quite a quite a few number of faculty using that. But we have a process at Butler where we um, have our IT colleagues look over the tools for data security for our students, um, what data is being collected and um, security, things like that. Um, and Hypothesis did pass our IT kind of standards, whereas uh, other tools did not. So that was also um, one of the things we appreciated about Hypothesis was their, their data and privacy policies. Um, Meg, I saw you come off mute and I'll let you 
continue with the rest of it. Yeah, no, thank you for that so much. You know, I would say our rollout here at Butler has been very gradual. Um, and it's been a combination of like open invitation, come check out this tool, come to this workshop, and also targeted communication. Um, I think we've had the most success when we connect with department chairs who are passionate about these kinds of tools. And then there's a trickle down effect in their department. Um, when I look at our dashboard, for instance, I see like splashes of interest from 2021 from um, you know, a certain college, and then I'm like, what happened there? And I think we did one workshop. But the sustained use over time has really happened at the department level. We have history and anthropology. It's mostly on the history side where we're seeing a lot of people use it from one semester to the next and using it over a period of time, which to me indicates more success than someone using it one semester and then never course, using yeah. it again, right? Because they're improving their usage over time. So we see a lot of it with history. Um, we also have a really strong advocate in political science um, who has shared it with her faculty, and then they've become interested in scheduled times with us to use it. So I think our best rollout strategy so far, and I'm going to let Kristen talk about kind of future state, what we'd like to do with more rollout around first year. But I think the best strategy so far for prolonged use and for increasingly um, expert use is to talk with department chairs, um, yeah. get into the department um, group and and really find your people who are open to this and are using documents in ways that they really need students to have this ability to annotate and have conversations. Yeah, and one of the things before we uh, go to Dana that I'll just say is I appreciate the point about disciplinarity and, and departments. One of the things that I'm very interested in, I should have disclosed at the front that I'm also a composition instructor by training. So my background is English and a lot of the entry uh, point has been the English department for several of these schools. Um, but we do see, as, as Dana can talk about, you know, diversifying the disciplinary use over time. Um, but one of the things that I'm very interested in and our CS team is very interested in is how do different disciplines use it differently? And how can we help uh, learn about that and share those lessons, right? So we're, we have some profiles on our site. We call them success stories that are always a particular professor in a particular discipline. And one of the things we really try to learn and then build training materials around is what does this mean for composition or first year writing? What does this mean for history? How is it different, right? Maybe it's primary source documents. Uh, what does it mean in political science? Maybe it's a lot more academic articles. And annotation is of course similar, but also different in those different contexts. And we really try to work with uh, to brainstorm ourselves and brainstorm with our faculty and then be able to bring to you guys uh, department specific trainings or department specific demos that speak to the goals and challenges of the, that particular area. So Dana, how did we do it? Started with writing, but now it's like across the entire Santa Cruz, uh, all the departments and colleges are involved, it seems like. Yeah. Many. So many. Um, I, I like Megan's idea of talking directly to department heads. Um, that seems to be the most effective path that um, I'd like to be able to take on, uh, not to jump ahead to the future, but <laughs> I'm a big workshop person. Um, when we had started our adoption, we um, were able to lean on the good people of Hypothesis, fabulous collaborators, um, to facilitate early workshops for us. And they were open to everyone. Um, and very well attended and workshops that we've had since in the past have been, you know, a trickling of people. So I really want to emphasize Megan's uh, idea of trying to target departments specifically, seeing how hypothesis can work with their courses. Um, like Vince, we also have a newsletter too, um, a monthly newsletter, which has also been very helpful with communicating in with instructors about upcoming workshops when we do have them and also just new features that are coming out. Um, and also, like Vince, we had also done a self-paced course as a resource for instructors. What I really liked about the hypothesis workshops when you guys did them with us and how I modeled my uh, workshops after that is that the instructors get hands-on immediately with the tool. Yep. It's not just a demonstration, but it was, here's yep. the text we're going to annotate together. Um, so I tried to model the course after that of like, here's an article, annotate it and also yeah. just resources, lots of links to uh, hypothesis resources, resources that we've created. Um, it's been repurposed recently. It's um, now focused less on, less on the technical instructions and more about the benefits of learning with social annotations uh, and how that activity helps their students. And putting that information directly in front of the instructors can help them shift their lens when they're evaluating technology. Yeah, I just wanna emphasize something that you've mentioned. I think a couple of you guys have mentioned that uh, you have or hypothesis has helped you 
build a course shell in your LMS that houses resources that can be used as a home base for work, a workshop or multiple workshops. So you can go, student teachers can go in there and actually practice using social annotation, of course, experience what it's gonna be like uh, in their own classrooms, but also there are resources they can go back to. Uh, when we're able to do that, it's it's really exciting. I think it becomes a lasting resource at the school to for everybody to be pointed to. Well, here's a course and you can jump in there. And it's always fun sometimes when we give a, you know, a workshop in year two or three, and you can go and you still see the article annotated by the original cohort of early adopters uh, and they can see their colleagues, right? The new, the new cohorts can see their colleagues. So definitely encourage folks to build up, build that kind of resource out if possible. And we, we have a model for it. We have templates for them. We literally have, you know, Canvas shells if you're a Canvas school to just go ahead and take it and it will have, be pre-populated with resources. And uh, if you can get our CSMs access, then we can build that out um, for you. Um, all right, let's move on to what the response has been. I think, um, this has been peppered throughout the conversation here that you've got some champions, you've got some excited teachers, they've helped get others excited. Um, but let's talk about what the response has been. And I'd love to hear, you know, if anybody has had contact with students or heard feedback via teachers from students, would love to hear that as well. And maybe we'll start with Portland uh, Community College, which has been quiet for a while. Hi, everyone. Uh, so some of the feedback that we've had from faculty, it's been very positive. Um, some of the things that, like you mentioned, have come out from other people so far is that uh, using hypothesis in a course has really kind of promoted reflection and made it more visible to students in the course and, and also helps build that community that also was mentioned earlier. It kind of takes what a typical discussion topic or a conversation would be from a solitary form of communication into this more collaborative form of communication. So students are really enjoying that part of it. They're, they're actually like almost even just the variety of the tool. It's a little bit refreshing from what a typical discussion tool in an LMS would be, a learning management system. So that's been kind of the student feedback about it. And it's also helped them with comprehension. I, I feel like some of the feedback that our faculty have given us is that when they kind of survey their students that they're noticing that there's better comprehension because they're seeing how their peers are going through a reading and kind of modeling that, using that as a way to kind of understand the reading in, in a different way that maybe they weren't getting on their own. And so it's been a, a really good way for them to kind of see how other people approach similar readings and um, kind of engaging the, the content that they're going through in the course. And then um, from the instructor's point of view, you know, similarly, they, they really like that it seems to be building that retention because they're they're kind of going through these talking concepts in the course. Like they, they can talk through the concepts with each other and it feels like that builds more, again, that that kind of flow through the conversation where it's not that individual person kind of going through it on their own. They're, it just feels like the students through that sense of community again, kind of builds that option for them to just persist through it and be able to read the same kind of content and kind of gain those different perspectives, I, th I think is kind of the feedback. So it's been mostly positive. Again, I think everyone from the faculty this, to the students have been enjoying it. It's been kind of a, a, a really fun tool to use. And so that's kind of been yeah, the, the type of feedback that we've been getting here at, at PCC from the faculty that are using it and the students as well. Great. Effective and fun. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's an important piece. I do think it's fun, right? The social piece is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Butler, you want to go next? So I have um, some, we did some formal assessment. Um, I worked closely with the department chair for political science. Um, she was part of our, our pilot um, when we did hypothesis and we sent out um, Qualtrics surveys to the students just to get a sense of, you know, what their what their thoughts were about hypothesis. And let me just export this really fast so I can see it. Um, and some of the things that we got from students is, you know, it made me a more active reader. It helped me to organize my reading. I learned a lot from my classmates annotations, which I love this because I love when learning becomes like it's not just the responsibility, the sage on the stage model, right? We want to learn from each other and other students too. So I really love that comment. It helped me prepare for class 
class. I had a student say that. And I also hear that from faculty because they can look at like the annotations and be like, okay, there was an annotation desert here. No one said anything. So no one wants to talk about this. <laughs> or we have a lot of annotations around this particular quote. We need to talk about it. Um, and it said, some students said, you know, it helped me think critically about the reading. They really appreciated that. Um, in terms of finding what features they found most useful for students, I was really impressed with what students had to say. A lot of them, um, I think 19% said they really liked annotation tags, which I didn't expect them to get into that level of annotation where they were using tagging categories to organize annotations, but we did see some of that and and that's to the credit really of the professor um, who was coaching them through this process. Um, as far as features they'd like added, it's funny because some of these I know are on the hypothesis roadmap. We had one student say different color highlights would be yeah. sick would be sick. <laughs> so they were super enthusiastic about this idea of different color highlights. And we know that's on the roadmap for hypothesis. So we're really excited about bringing that to students. Um, but yeah, so we've gotten pretty positive feedback. And I will say, a lot of the questions that we use to build out this survey to use with students, we pluck directly from the hypothesis website. So the hypothesis has suggestions on how to do assessment and how to, you know, ch check the efficacy with your students. And then you can work with faculty to implement these sorts of surveys. And I think it's really helpful. And I give full credit um, to the professor. Um, shout out to Dr. Robin Turner at Butler University. Um, <laughs> she is so organized and thoughtful in her implementation of academic technology and was a great partner and kind of reaching out and being like, hey, could we, you know, what kind of assessment can we use with students? What does this look like? Um, so, so that's really been a good experience. Yeah. And talking Thanks. about the resources on the website as well. I think one of the things that impressed our faculty right off the bat who were considering using hypothesis was the rubrics and rubric examples mm. that were um, supplied by the hypothesis team. Every time we do a new training, that's, you know, that's, the, that's what's on there. Like, how do I assess this? What does assessment look like for this activity? And the fact that there's not just examples of assignments, but also the rubrics and the evaluation, I think has been really powerful. Thanks for adding that, Kristen. Yeah, we're really, I'm, I'm really proud of the resources we built. Again, we're a team of educators on the success team largely, and so everybody's contributing to assignments. And when we find somebody like your colleague at Butler that's got a great assignment, we ask if we can add it to our resource and uh, resource collection. And uh, Becky George has added a link to our success stories, but we should also add a link uh, in the chat to our to our resource collection where those rubrics and other assignments and activities um, live and i just also want to reiterate one thing that megan said which is if you are interested in surveying we do have some questions that we can share uh, as a model for how you might survey and one and that's so cool about the tags it imagines that even uh, someone like dana who's been working with folks for years with our social annotation uh you know maybe we could do another survey to kind of see some of the deeper ways how are how are folks using the tool right are they using tags um i think tags is something that i really would like to help folks like you all help teachers uh, leverage, um, you know, for the reason that that student mentioned, and we could maybe dig into it, like why tags are helpful, why they mm -hmm. maybe help occasion what David was saying, the kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, Dana, I guess I kind of forgot where we were in the sequence here, but maybe you could go next if you have uh, anything about what the reaction has been. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for sharing the reactions from students because um, we don't have feedback directly from students. That's not information that we collect, but something I would like to see. So it's really awesome to hear that the students have the reaction to this tool. Um, I personally use it too. I love it. <laughs> so I'm not even a student or an instructor and I use hypothesis myself. Um, the responses that we've seen from teachers, um, of course, we have a steady use of new users every term along with our champions. Um, and as everyone else has seemed to have the theme of, you know, it spreads word of mouth. I wish I could take more credit for spreading hypothesis across my campus, but it's really the instructors talking to each other about what's working great for them in their classes, which is great. And I really love that. Thanks, Vince. I'm curious, can I ask a question? Oh, good. Um, I, I heard David say, kind of emphasize like the community building aspect of the tool. And I'm I'm curious, like the other institutions, you're um, if, like, if you could talk about that a little. Great question, Kristen. Yeah, community building. 
Anybody else have anything to add about that? Building the kind of community of the classroom through a tool like Hypothesis? Yes, it's good for reading comprehension, critical thinking, but what about this other idea of community? Go ahead, James. If I may um, share something directly from one of our faculty, show and tells, um, one of our champions of hypothesis instructor, Teresa Love, who's an instructor we work with pretty closely, you know, actually on a week to week basis. So she was doing a faculty show and tell, and she had two takeaways from her use of hypothesis because both individual and social annotation is very important to her. And of course, she said, okay, it's the importance of, okay, you as the instructor giving clear direction about what's the nature of the assignment, right? You know, interconnectedness between assigned texts, right? Uh, how many highlights or replies required? But her final takeaway really, really struck with, so I will quote from it directly. It says, it's the importance of valuing classroom community in the social dimension of learning. And she loves this acronym, NW, N, M, W, no matter what, protect or allow reading confusion, share text talk, promote netiquette, and build a collaborative culture of safety and respect. And the tool actually promotes this within the online classroom. That is great. Um, thanks for sharing that. And also Leslie from the audience has said that she uses the group tool um, in D2L. And that is something that can help, especially if you're teaching a large course and every, you know, there's a, uh, lots of students in the course, you can break those, those, th those big classes into smaller groups. So sometimes, you know, calibrating the size of the reading and annotating group can help nurture community because maybe in too big of a, of a course, those, those voices can get lost. So that's a good practical strategy. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I want to shift to the final question here, but kind of uh, change it at the same time. So the final question is about results. Um, I'll, I'll let anybody who kind of prepared for that uh, question to, to share, but don't feel obligated because I do want to go on and sort of talk about like, what's, what's the future look like uh, for Hypothesis at University? So does anybody want to talk about results? It sounds kind of scientific. We've talked a little bit about the qualitative response, but does anybody, did anybody prepare or think about this particular, and there's a question about efficacy from the, from the Q&A. We do have some studies that we can share uh, about hypothesis and about social annotation in a variety of different uh, contexts and, and efficacy. Um, but in terms of results, what would you guys say? What are you seeing at this point? I mean, I, I would just go back to the idea if you have department chairs who are enthusiastic about it um, and promote this kind of technology with the faculty they work with, um, those are the users I'm seeing time and again use it. Um, and that's been really helpful. So that's been a major takeaway at this point. Um, and one of the other thing that's, things that's interesting is the departments that um, use it most here at Butler, which would be histories, our top department here at Butler that uses it. Um, a lot of those faculty also teach in our core curriculum. So mm -hmm. our core curriculum courses um, are really designed to kind of anchor the curriculum in the liberal arts. So we'll have everything from global and historical studies to, um, you know, first year seminar and all of those things. So they've carried it over, not only using it in their disciplines, but also using it with students who might otherwise not be exposed to it in their discipline, right, through their core curriculum courses. So I, I really like it if you can find those faculty who are who are interacting with first year students or or maybe second year students in the core curriculum and, and getting them involved at that point in it. So that even if they don't continue to use it throughout their educational career, they can use it in the wild and get excited yeah. about using it. Um, I think the other takeaways that I see, I see a lot of faculty interest. Um, but I think there's this type of uh, question around like, how do you implement it, right? How do you implement it well? What does good annotation really look like versus, mm. you know, just kind of phoning in the annotation? How do you do a mm. low stakes assignment versus a high stakes assignment? What does a high stakes assignment look like in hypothesis? So I think really relying and shout out to Becky George. She's our CSM here <laughs> for Butler. Amazing. I think really relying on more and more. I mean, we're going to be relying on Becky to help us in terms yeah. of getting messaging out to faculty, getting resources out to faculty so that faculty feel empowered and confident in their use of the tool. Um, and, and then that way they can get to the point where they, you know, start to develop their own assignments 
also, I'd like to be better about getting faculty involved in like the educators forum. There's an educators forum in Slack um, and just part of the conversation so that there's a, a wider network. You know, I had a faculty member the other day uh, mention that it would be really nice to have a consortium of rubrics and Hypothesis does have rubrics available, which is nice. Um, but even just leaning more internally throughout our campus and getting examples of rubrics and assignment prompts that we can share across faculty. And then Kristen unmuted too, so I wanted to give her an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's also, in addition to that, we've seen ties to some of like our larger strategic initiatives on campus, um, cool. particularly our low cost, no cost textbook initiative, because hypothesis works best with like OER text, open text. Um, there's some like new like JSTOR integrations and things like that. But um, we've had faculty, you know, be interested in this and then have conversations with us or librarians about, okay, I want to use this. Like now I need to um, find a new text that'll work with hypothesis. And um, and so it, it's it's aligning pretty closely with our goals to like lower the cost of textbooks with for our students. And in addition to that, then like driving some student engagement um, as well around that text. Um, I think also on our campus, we've um, we've identified our first year students as one of, kind of some strategies around first year experience specifically. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, this is one tool that we're considering and having starting conversations with um, that group specifically about so thinking about right like what what department should we target next that that was a big key one particularly because the institutions already moving that direction there's momentum that way um, and so there was a question in the chat like where's the data on the effectiveness of it um, we're super thankful that hypothesis partnered with indiana university and came out with that big study about the first year experience because that's something that now we're able to share with our instructors and say you know like just down the road <laughs> from us yeah. in indiana um they've actually done a pretty extensive study and, and let's look at those results together and is this something that we should consider here yeah and we can share the the result. Uh, there's several publications that came out of that Indiana study. And I'd just put a plug here that in terms of partnership, in terms of collaboration, one of the things that in my role at Hypothesis as VP of Education that I try to do is to partner with campuses, whether it's around the surveys that Megan did at Butler or something larger like the you know um, IRB sanctioned uh, research that we did in Indiana. So you folks on the call, but also you folks in the audience, like there are opportunities for uh, research or efficacy studies, big or small, like let's get together. Um, right now I'm working with UT Austin on a, some work around a physics course that's been using hypothesis with a textbook, which was a question that got asked in the, in the audience here. We do work with Vital Source as a delivery for a delivery platform for e-text. Um, and we're seeing some amazing data coming out of that, basically that back to, I think Megan's point early on, like there's a lot of students don't that aren't doing the reading, that aren't cracking the textbook, that vital source can see that when they look at the data around how many times people are opening the textbook throughout a semester, throughout a semester. And when social orientation is part of it, it flips, right? So there's a lot more people opening the textbook, not just opening it, but using it throughout the term. Um, I'm just gonna go down here for these kind of final words. Vince, you're next. I just wanted to say that the feedback that we've been getting from our faculty has been overwhelmingly positive. And one of the things that we have found is that hypothesis really fills a sort of a unique niche within, if you want to call it our technology tool belt, but our suite of tools that we offer to faculty across our campuses, because it really encourages that collaboration and critical thinking among students that we really previously didn't have or was made available to faculty in the form of a tool that they could implement in their classroom. So that has been just absolutely transformative for those faculty who you know, are not necessarily asking their students to create video content, but you know, need them to really think more critically about the kinds of readings that they are doing as part of what is their coursework. And I just wanted to say that we've also been very uh, closely involved in the JSTOR as well as the vital source integrations uh, within Hypothesis. We found those to be, you know, very positive opportunities for faculty to, you know, further extend their use of the tool. 
Um, it has enabled our library and their liaisons to get more closely involved with faculty and how they use uh, resources. So, Great. you know, overall, we're looking for more opportunities like that from Hypothesis just to continue to grow its, its operation and use. That's awesome, Vince. Let's talk you, me, and Suzanne later about uh, growing the vital source usage because I'd like to share what we know, what we've seen at UT and elsewhere. Uh, Portland Community College. Yeah, just to kind of um, go off of what Vince said, a lot of the feedback's been really great with from faculty, and it is another great tool in our tool set as well. We do offer a, a couple of others there, in, in regards to like communication, kind of creating that community in a course. Um, some other things with, um, I think with our kind of faculty show and tell that we've done, it's been a great place for our faculty to see how other instructors are using the tool in their courses and kind of using that as a way to implement it into their own course. A lot of the post-training feedback that we get from our faculty in the situations are, oh, you know, I wanna change one assignment into a hypothesis assignment in the future term because they can see the benefits of using it or they at least wanna try to engage students in a new way using a new tool and hypothesis is you know constantly evolving so that's something that we really enjoy seeing the changes that are being implemented the team at hypothesis has been taking our feedback into consideration making improvements and we really kind of work with as we mentioned before with jessica and and the others to try to jessica fuller to you know kind of implement what we can so we're really looking forward to seeing how the tool evolves and how it can really uh, be another great asset for our college here at Portland Community College. Thanks, David. Dana? Well, everyone has kind of said a lot of fantastic takeaways from their own courses. So I'll just say broadly, of course, we it's been positive at my campus too. Um, I wanted to build off a little bit of what Christian, uh, Kristen had hinted at, which is, you know, using hypothesis with um, OER resources. And a nice side effect of hypothesis has been making people more aware of what makes documents accessible, since optical character recognition mm -hmm. is a requirement for hypothesis. I love the integrations with JSTOR and Vital Source, fabulous, but a lot of the readings that, um, that our instructors want to use are, um, you know, image scans of PDFs and um, teaching them why they need to make their documents accessible if they want to use this fabulous tool that they've heard about has been a really helpful conversation to get started with faculty. That's great, Dana. Yeah. Lots of digital literacies attached to social reading, not just the, the reading of text. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I very much appreciate all of you, uh, your partnership, but also the conversation today. I've got a few closing remarks before we say a bit ado. Um, I want to mention if you're in the audience and you're not yet partnering with Hypothesis to reach out to Education at Hypothesis, there is going to be a fall back to school with Hypothesis promotion. So again, if you're not yet a partner, um, please reach out to Education at Hypothesis and we can tell you more about um, the discounts we're offering to, to get started with the fall. Uh, if you are a partner, and I'll just stop and say, you know, our CS team was shouted out many times today, the customer success team. I'm very proud of the work that they do. Um, they're a key part of this conversation um, and part of the work that, the, 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 that our guests are, are doing. Um, and there's a wide range of very uh, of valuable resources that they are responsible for creating and stewarding. Uh, one of those are our partner workshops. Of course, if you're a partner, we do customized workshops for your campus, uh, but we also host partner workshops that are open to all customers. Um, and you missed uh, annotation starter assignments, but there is a recording of that one that you can access on YouTube. And then there are three more uh, workshops as part of our summer series. There's one on creative ways to use social annotation, one on using multimedia and tags, again, to deepen in the use of some of the features, and then one on grading uh, and feedback. And that's again, it's one of the neat things about Hypothesis it's kind of a simple tool, uh, definitely takes you know, a little bit of learning to onboard, but really the work is around the pedagogy of it. And I wanna go back to one thing that Megan says was, that said was about, uh, or made me think about was, what does annotation look like in the first year uh, experience program? What does it look like as one it develops into different disciplines? Uh, what does it look like across those different disciplines? It means something different at, in all those places. And we're still doing the work. This is still a relatively new technology. Our collaboration is, is, you know, we're learning about from the, you guys, what does this mean in biology? What does it mean in upper level biology? What does it mean for grad students? What does it mean for a big entry level biology course? And I'm very excited to continue to build out 
that thinking around what social annotation looks like at different levels and in different disciplines and really welcome collaboration around that. Um, and then the final resource I wanna share before we close is Hypothesis Academy. Christy DeCarolis, who's been the, the co-host here today, uh, haven't had a lot of questions from the Q&A, so she's been a little quiet, um, but working in the background to answer folks' questions. Uh, she runs Hypothesis Academy. She invented Hypothesis Academy. It's an asynchronous training course, two weeks long. A uh, really great way to dive into the tool uh, with some guidance from our team, but also in collaboration with folks from other universities and colleges who are also going through the course. So we have a kind of introductory course, uh, Social Annotation 101, kicks off end of this month, the next cohort. And then we're also starting next week, um, our first you know, uh, course on social annotation and artificial intelligence. So that's a new course, obviously a new topic. Um, and if you have folks at your campus that are interested, please, please let them know. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you so much uh, guests for the conversation today. Really, really great to hear your stories. Um, and so thrilled that we're partners and we can continue in this collaboration and conversation uh, moving forward. So thanks for your time today and, uh, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon.